So uh, a few weeks ago, I was trying to plug something in. I needed power for something, and, and the, the cable didn't reach, and I needed an extension. And I was like, oh, man, I haven't got an extension. I've got extensions all over my house, but they're all being used. I was like, I haven't got a power extension. I can't get power to this thing. I haven't got power. I can't do the thing I'm supposed to do. And then a few days ago, Shay is doing a declutter, and she pulls something away from the wall, and she goes, oh, you've got a big power extension here. I'm like, oh, man, I had a power extension the whole time. I had it the whole time, but I didn't know it was there, and so I didn't use it, and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And the same way in life, we got an incredible amount of power accessible to us, and we often don't know we got that power. We often forget we got that power, and we don't do the things we're supposed to do. And 2,000 years ago, Paul was concerned about the Ephesians, that they wouldn't get how much power was accessible to them. He wanted them to know about how much power they had. And so that's what he wrote about. That's what we're going to look at today in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. But first, let's pray. Lord God, please give us your power now. I pray that you give power for me to teach accurately your word. I pray that you give everyone power to be able to hear it and understand it and concentrate on it. And for all of us, Lord God, I pray that you would change us as we look at your word. Change our hearts, change our understanding. Help us to get your truths today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so you might remember last week, right? In, um, in verse 18, he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So he told them what he, he would pray for them. He was praying this for them regularly. And he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you will know, and he talks about the hope and their inheritance. And then today's thing we're looking at in verse 19 he shows us that he's also praying that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened, that they would know his incomparably great what? Power for us who believe. So he wanted them to know that there is incomparably great power for us who believe. He wanted them to know that because we have a tendency to not know how much power is accessible to us. In some ways, it's like we live as if we've got a power cut going on, some kind of spiritual power cut in our lives. And it <laughs> seems there's a little, tiny little newborn girl trying to, trying to steal the show here. Um, okay, so you know when you have a power cut and you say, like, oh no, I can't use my computer, I can't use the electric oven and all this kind of stuff, can't watch TV and all that. Sometimes in our lives, we act as if we're going for a spiritual power cut, as if, oh, no, I've got no strength right now. I've got no energy. Oh, no, I can't do anything. And it's not true. It's not true because every day, all the time, we have his incomparably great power for us who believe. And notice, Paul doesn't just say power. He says great power, but he doesn't just say great power. What does he say? incomparably great power. He's like he's piling on these words to let us know this is a ridiculous amount of power for you. It's accessible to you right now for, for us who believe. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we have this power on tap in our lives. And then he describes this power. He says that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So Paul's describing this power. If you're wondering what kind of power is accessible to you as a Christian, it's the same type of power that raised Christ from the grave. The same power. So sometimes we think, oh, I'm not very powerful. Sure, Jesus was very powerful, but not me. But the Bible tells us the same power that raised Jesus from the grave, that same power is accessible to you if you believe in Jesus. That is an incredible amount of power, right? The, the same power that raised Christ from the grave, 
that same amount of power is accessible to us. And it says about this mighty strength, in verse 20 it says, the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. This power is going in a direction. What direction is it going in? Up to, up to heaven, right? And the power is exalting Christ. He, Jesus died on the cross. He was in the grave. And then this power exalted him up to the heavens. That is the focus of this power. That is the direction of this power. It's a power that exalts Jesus. So what does that mean for us? That, that means, right, that, that God gives us power so that we can big up Jesus. Okay? So sometimes you might feel you're powerless and feel like you can't do anything for God. But God will give you power to exalt Jesus. That power is on, top, on tap to exalt Jesus. But the way it doesn't work is it doesn't mean we got this power to big up ourselves. Okay? It doesn't mean, yeah, I got power and I can big up myself. I can do whatever I want. I can make myself this and I can do that and I can accomplish that. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. The power that we got is a, is a Christ exalting power that bigs Jesus up. So there might be times where you feel totally powerless and there might be loads of things you can't do. You might not even be able to go to work. And you might not be able to run that marathon that you were hoping to do. But you'll always be able to exalt Christ in some way. Even if you feel powerless, ask God for the power and he will give you the power to exalt Christ in some way. There's loads of famous Christians that in some ways had a tragic ending. They were murdered because they believed in Jesus and they wouldn't give up their testimony. And we didn't, we didn't see them in their last breath suddenly get incredible power and break free of their chains and run out of the arena and escape or anything like that. But what we did see is people having the power that meant they stood up for Jesus in their last final minutes and they exalted Jesus even though they seemed powerless. And that same power is available to us. And look what else it says about it. Verse 20, he exerted when he, this mighty strength, he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority. Then what does it say? Power. power. So far above all power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So what it's saying is this mighty strength, this power, Raise Jesus up to the right hand of Father God, okay? And where he's seated, and in ancient culture, like the, the seating there is often what you would do after you had a victory over your enemies. And you're like, I won now. You wouldn't stand, you would sit. And that's what Jesus did at the cross. He had a victory over his enemies. He had a victory over the devil. He had a victory over the power of sin. He had a victory over death. And he rose up. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And there, that power raised him far above any other power that exists. Now, what does that mean for us today? Well, what opposing powers are you facing right now? For some of you, it might be fear. Fear is kind of stopping you exalting Christ. For some of you, it might be other people are opposing you and they're stopping you exalting Christ. There might be other stuff going on. You might have health problems that are kind of stopping you exalting Christ. And what this shows us is that even with those opposing forces, you've got the same power that lifted Christ above all of those forces. The power in you is more powerful than any opposing force in your life right now, which means these opposing forces can't stop us exalting Christ, can't stop us magnifying Christ, bigging him up, making much of Jesus, glorifying. There's no opposing forces that can stop us. But I bet that each one of us every now and then gets a kind of little lie in our head that tells us, oh, you can't do this because of that, you can't do this because of that. 
And we've got to believe this truth. Paul wants us to know that we have this power that is far greater than any opposing force. Okay. Verse 22. Then it says, And God placed all things under his feet. Okay, so here you've got this idea of Jesus on the throne and Father God saying, I'm putting everything under your feet. Okay. And right now, this is the time period we're living in. We've seen, we've seen this happen. It's happened at, uh, at the resurrection, sorry, at Christ's resurrection and exaltation. <laughs> His death, resurrection, and exaltation it happened. But in a sense, it hasn't happened yet because Christ hasn't come back to consummate his kingdom. So we're living in this already but not yet time right now, okay? Um, and then when you hear about all things under his feet, you might wonder, well, what does that mean for us? Is that like we'll be crushed by Jesus one day? Does that mean that we're under his feet right now when we're crushed? And is that kind of scary? But look what it says. It says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for who? For the church. So it's for the church. So what this is telling us is that, yes, Christ has got everything under his feet. And where it doesn't look like that right now, it's because we're in the already not yet. And, and it's happening, but we're waiting to see the final day when we see that complete. But that isn't a bad thing for us if we believe in Jesus. We are the church. And Jesus did this for us. Him being exalted to the Father and, and the Father placing everything under Jesus' feet is, is actually for us, for the church. Now, if today you had any thoughts of feeling you're insignificant, that thought surely has got to make you realize how much significance you've got today. <laughs> that Jesus, the Father God, Holy Spirit, they did this for the church. It's absolutely incredible. Why? Well, it says in verse 23, which is his body. The church is Christ's body. So, so why would this be done for the church? Because the church is Christ's body. So it makes sense that Christ would do it for his body. And that just shows us how wonderful the concept of church is. It says, which is his body? The fullness of him. So the church is actually the fullness of Christ. Christ fills the church with his presence. It's absolutely incredible. Now check it out. For, for back in ancient times in the Roman Empire, this kind of language would be used. I think it's this language. Yeah, I think so. I think, sorry if I make it a mistake here. It's in one of these verses here. This language would be used to try and to show people how they related to the state. So to try and get people to be like good citizens and feel like they really belong to their state. We kind of have a similar thing today where different people have a different sense of loyalty to either their homeland or the country they're living in or a tribe or whatever it is. Some people are very patriotic. Um, and, and what Paul was saying to the Ephesians is, is he's saying, what you really need to get is how your Christ body. That's what you really need to get. In the same way, and I'm not saying here to pretend that you don't have any kind of affiliation with the country you were born in or the country you're living in or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but the thing that we really need to get is that we're Christ's body. The church is Christ's body. And I think we so badly need to get that today because I think, I think that in general, church is viewed as an extracurricular club, yeah? And I, I think that church is kind of viewed as you do all your other things in the week and whatever energy you got left, give a bit to the church. I, re I really think that is how church is often viewed. But here we see church is Christ's body. It's the fullness of him. Christ has had all authority put underneath him for the church. Which means church isn't an end of the week activity. Church isn't a, if you've got a bit of energy left in the week, maybe volunteer a bit with the church, maybe turn up at this, maybe do this, or, or maybe go and visit someone, catechize them. Not, not that. Instead, it's the other way around. It's like, we are the church, 
And then everything else is like a, a smaller thing. And if we can, we want to link the smaller things in with the church rather than there being this kind of, you know, in British politics there's this saying, you know, we don't do faith, you know. Um, and there's this kind of division between secular and sacred. And instead we want a bigger vision of the church where we're like, my whole life is the church. I'm going to say church here, I don't just mean our little gathering here, but I mean all of Christ's people, all of Christ's people for, for all time and all place. And this is Christ's body and it's everything and it's the fullness of him. And then everything else in our life, we work out how that fits around church, Christ's body. Now, now check it out. Um, it then says, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills what? He fills, what does Christ fill? Everything. He fills everything in every way. What's that about? So we're living in the already but not yet, right? And what's happening right now, and what we're going to see consummated at the end, is Christ filling everything on earth and in heaven above, filling everything with his presence, with his glory, with God's fullness. That's what Christ is doing. It's not finished yet. It's still going on. Okay, but that's what Christ is doing. We don't see that totally yet in Roehampton, right? We can't say all of Roehampton is filled with Christ. But one day in the new heavens and new earth, we'll say, wow, the whole area is filled with Christ. Whatever Roehampton looks like in the new heavens and new earth, I don't know. This is what, this is what Christ is doing, right? But here's, here's the really interesting thing. He does it through the church. He fills everything through his church. This is why he's been, he's been, had every authority put under his feet for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The church is actually the fullness of Christ. Christ fills the church and the church keeps on growing as more and more people turn to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And gradually we're seeing Christ filling everything. And what that means is, if Jesus was blowing up a balloon, the pump he would use would be the church. Okay? If he was blowing up a balloon, the pump he would use would be the church. If Jesus is going to fill everywhere with his presence, the vehicle he uses is the church. Which makes sense because the church is his body, the fullness of him. I don't know if I'm confusing people or providing clarity, but I find this very interesting. It's like if Jesus was vacuuming up the world, getting rid of all the dirt, the vacuum cleaner he would use would be the church. But in this case, he's filling everything. So we're talking about blowing up balloons. So what does this mean? Let's kind of like sum up this stuff, right? Um, we regularly will feel powerless in lots of situations. Life will push you to situations where you feel you don't have power, okay? And um, in those situations, we can give up, we can drop out, we can run away, or we can find something else to do that seems easier. What God wants to do is to fill us with his power so that we can exalt Christ, so that as the church, we can fill up everywhere with Christ's presence. That's what he wants to do with us. And, and for us to be able to do that, we have to know how much power we have. And is the power we have any different to the power that rise Christ from the grave? No, it's the same power. So we've got a ridiculous amount of power to us, but we need to know we've got it. So what this means for us is in the week, if you feel weak, Pray to God to give you power. But remember, the power isn't to big yourself up. The power is to big up Christ. If, if, you, feel, if, you, if you feel like, do you know what? There's ways in which, there's ways in which um, I'm not diverting my power into Christ's church. 
And remember, I'm not just talking about the local church, or local church is very important, but the whole big broad church. Then ask God for the power that you can spend more energy on Christ's church. Maybe some of you feel a bit of a mug. You know, um, in, in every church, there's a small handful of people that every now and then feel like a mug because they feel like they're constantly doing stuff for the church and they feel like maybe it's a bit of a waste. On my deathbed, what have I got to show for it? And what this shows us here is spending your power on the church is the best way to spend your power. It really is. In the new heavens and new earth, that's, we're going to be looking at the fullness of Christ. Everything that we've done for Christ's church, for his body, is going to count. So don't feel like a mug if you're spending a lot of energy on Christ's church. It might be that this week, what we also want to start doing is praying for one another that God will help each one of us to know the power that we've got so that whatever we're going through in the week, we are able to make much of Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you because you died on the cross and you rose again. And you sat down next to the Father with all authority underneath you. And you did that for us. And you made us your body. And we thank you for that and we praise you for that. And we pray that, Holy Spirit, you'd open the eyes of our heart to understand that better, to have a deeper revelation of what it means to be your church, to be your body. And we also pray that you'd help us all to know how much power we got and to use our power to big you up, Jesus Christ. Help us to each know what that means for us in this week and in this month and in this season so that we can glorify you and play our part in seeing you fill everything in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.